Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Welcome to the Winter Enrichment Program. My name is Mohammed Abdel Al. I'm the Director of Digital Experience and Innovation here at KAUST. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mohammed Sharaf uh, I've met Dr. Sharaf at least three times so far this year or last year, all virtually on conferences and panels. I've had, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting him in person yet. And yet we meet again today in web. Uh, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Sharaf Dean today. Uh, Dr. Sharaf Dean is the VP of Product Management for the Mobility Platform at Karim. Uh, prior to joining Karim in the summer of 2019, he spent some time at the AI R&D labs of Samsung, and he later joined Facebook working in their core machine learning team for business integrity on platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger. Today, uh, Dr. Sharaf Dean is going to introduce the vision and idea of AtomNet, the Internet of Atoms for the Mobility of Things. He compares the world of bits to the world of atoms, and he talks about the future of how the world will be connected with humans, machines, autonomous vehicles, and others. So with that in mind, uh, Dr. Sharaf Dean, I'll give you the platform, and again, welcome to the KAUST Winter Enrichment Program. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me share my screen and we can get started. So I'll be talking about the uh, vision of AtomNet, the Internet of Atoms for the Mobility of Things. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sharaf Dean, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mohammed Tweets. So let me introduce uh, uh, myself, tell a little bit, uh, talk to you a little bit about my background. Uh, I did my master and PhD at Stanford. Uh, I know some of the faculty at Gauss who were uh, classmates and colleagues. And thank you, Khalid, for the invitation. Uh, and then I worked at my uh, co-advisor startup uh, called Asia to manage and improve the uh, telco networks for companies like AT&T, Verizon, so on and so forth. After that, uh, I uh, decided to move into the business world and product management. So I joined uh, uh, Berkeley High School of Business. I did my MBA there. And then I led the Applied AI Lab, R&D Lab at Samsung in San Jose, uh, where we developed uh, the world first uh, reinforcement learning and AI enterprise platform at scale, uh, quoting Bob Sutton, who's the, uh, uh, the father of reinforcement learning. Uh, it's the best implementation of parallel at scale. Super proud of that achievement uh, with the team there. And then I moved on to Facebook in uh, Menlo Park in the uh, Bay Area, where, where I work at the Core ML uh, team for business integrity. Business integrity is anything that makes uh, money and anything that makes uh, business uh, revenue to, uh, to Facebook, whether ads or marketplace. And by this, we uh, understand and classify all the ad content, uh, text, images, different languages, video uh, on all Facebook, Instagram, uh, and Messenger. Uh, some of the issues are hot topics like uh, uh, politics, political ads, issue ads like abortion, medical ads, uh, uh, hate speech, so on and so forth. After that, uh, I came to the region, to Dubai in late 2019. Uh, I joined Karim. Uh, and in 2020, I was leading uh, mobility engineering, uh, mobility of people, mobility of things, infrastructure, data and AI at Kareem, about 75% of the engineering body there. Starting this year, uh, I'm moving back to product and will be leading the mobility platform as a VP of product. Uh, with Kareem, we launched the super app platform. We, we launched the super app uh, to make everyday life uh, simple. Uh, Let's start, let's start with the, this tweet. It's a seemingly simple tweet. Uh, you can take a look at it and read it. Uh, this is uh, uh, the CEO and founder of Cruise Automation that got acquired by GM. And uh, seven years finally did it, nobody behind the wheels. Uh, so proud of the cruise team. And this is the exact moment it happened. So what is this moment that it happened? Uh, I will not play the, uh, the video, but uh, I just, I'll capture it here. Sorry. I'll capture it here. Uh, we're going driverless. It just happened. And you could see the CEO, the founder, uh, so excited about this uh, moment. 
So what exactly happened? This is uh, what I want to, to uh, unpack. What exactly happened? So what happened using the zero to one analogy from uh, Peter Thiel is that an autonomous vehicle that is licensed from the California DMV, Department of Motor Vehicle, is driving on public streets, urban public streets in San Francisco with no human behind the wheel. So this is the, uh, the big moment in tech. This is the, the zero to one. This is when the one happened. It's a technology innovation that is seeing the light of day. Uh, it's no longer an R&D. It's no longer uh, you know, uh, a lab in the lab. It's actually in the wild on public streets and it is actually licensed uh, by the DMV. So in the uh, autonomous vehicle and classification of, uh, of autonomy, we are in level four, autonomous vehicle level four happened uh, with a fully autonomous vehicle on a, a map, high definition map uh, uh, geography. So mapping this into a zero to one and one to N, uh, it took more than 10 years, starting with the Google self-driving car project uh, in 2009, mo took more than 10 years to get to one. Uh, there's all that technical innovation, uh, and we are now that, that we got to the one, we proved that the technology can work. Uh, now we are, and we will soon start the phase of scale and globalization. So now we'll take this that, that went from zero to one, now it will enter a new phase that will go from one to N. And just to uh, you know, talk about that, that moment uh, a little bit more, uh, Cruz just recruited as the COO, uh, uh, the CEO of an airlines company, a big American airline companies. They are uh, uh, looking at the self-driving vehicles, similar to uh, an airplane. Uh, it needs servicing, it needs cleanup, and uh, there will be hundreds uh, of thousands of them. Uh, so uh, we are soon will be entering the phase of scale and globalization. This will take another 10 years for mainstream uh, adoption. What else has happened in that moment, that inflection point in, the, in history? What else has happened? Uh, Waymo in 2020 uh, got the approval to open its self-driving car uh, service uh, to the public in Phoenix. Uh, you can order uh, a Waymo car. Uh, there can be someone behind the wheels. Uh, in Phoenix. Phoenix is less complex than the downtown San Francisco. Waymo has partnered with uh, Daimler uh, to apply the same technology, but for uh, trucks. Uh, trucks is a much, uh, uh, especially for interstate highways for long distance, it's a relatively more controlled environment than an environment in a downtown that is very urban with cars, with uh, you know, with uh, bicycles. Uh, so it's a less uh, environment with less entropy. Uh, so you'd see trucks as a good use case for interstate on long, long distance travel. What else happened? Uh, Amazon acquired Zooks, uh, announced the acquisition of Zooks. Amazon has also acquired uh, other uh, self-driving uh, startups, especially a sidewalk delivery startup. Um, and they will use that technology for both the mobility of people, but also mobility of things. Amazon is also a very uh, a strong player in the regulation uh, and kind of shaping the regulation for drone delivery um, and is investing heavily in the space. What else happened in December last month, uh, a company called Neuro, uh, in the Bay Area also got uh, the grant from the California DMV for delivery autonomous deployment permit uh, of its vehicle. Uh, its vehicle classify as a low speed vehicle. It has its own uh, regulatory clause uh, for transportation. It can go on low speed up to 25 miles per hour, uh, low speed roads. Uh, and it's completely, there's no human driver in it by design. What else happened? Uh, Tesla announced its, uh, for its hardware that supports uh, full driving capability. Uh, it's already shipping on thousands of cars in the streets. Uh, those cars are also data collection vehicles. They are um, 
also collecting data on the long tail uh, of events. Uh, in doing self-driving, developing self-driving technology, you need to test it in the real world. And the real world is full of edge cases and long, long tail events. A Tesla is already you know, operational, is already in the wild, in the real world. All those edge cases, weather condition, congestion con condition, accidents, all of that is being collected uh, on the car, on the Tesla cars right now. Uh, Tesla is unique in the self-driving uh, industry where it's not using LiDAR. It's already fully relying on uh, rad radar, GPS, and cameras. Uh, uh, with a stereo cameras, you could also detect the uh, direction of movement, and you would use LiDAR for depth information. You could also, with a large amount of, of data, uh, you could also figure out the depth information from cameras. Uh, uh, not using LIDARs. Tesla is unique in that, in that sense compared to the industry. However, it's also unique from a scale point of view. And now with that hardware and that those sensors already in the wild, it's doing a lot of collection. That collection will come in the, on the cloud. They'll do train a machine learning model uh, for perception and for path planning. Okay, why is this all of this coming together? Why is this happening? This has been eight to 10 years uh, to get to this moment. Why is it happening? Uh, software is eating the world. A lot of data is becoming online. Uh, that infrastructure, uh, that data being online, it needed a cloud for better economy of scale on hosting and compute. AWS is there, cloud compute is there, a Google uh, cloud platform is there, uh, Azure is there from uh, Microsoft. With this data, there's also a development, it triggered a development in the AI algorithms. Those can be done at scale on the cloud and also develop a loss, low power inference on the edge. Uh, there's a lot of development, uh, deep compression. There's a lot of development there to allow that uh, reduction of the model uh, and have it run on the edge. This also triggered uh, innovation in robotics. Now that we have cameras, we could understand an unstructured uh, environment from uh, unstructured data like cameras and videos. This allowed a better perception of the algorithm using deep learning and also uh, uh, allowed for a better decision making for path planning and motion planning with, re with reinforcement learning. That innovation in robotics, a car, by the way, is a robot uh, on wheels. Uh, with also uh, coupling the innovation in uh, a democratization of the knowledge with, com with companies like Udacity on Coursera. A lot of the code is uh, publicly available on GitHub. Um, there's a lot of diffusion of knowledge elsewhere, uh, outside kind of the top universities, the Ivy League university, anyone has access to that knowledge. Those professors or whoever are the instructors uh, teach at Stanford, uh, Berkeley, elsewhere, or could be also uh, uh, lead principal engineers at, uh, at Google and Facebook. So that diffusion of knowledge and talent uh, created people to innovate in this field, allowed incentivized people to innovate in the space and uh, billion dollars of capital chased that talent that is capable talent uh, and invested billions of dollars in the uh, autonomous vehicle, both manned and unmanned uh, space. With this come the lobbying for easing the regulation, allowing for testing, allowing for permits, uh, a new industry evolved how to bring this to reality and work with the regulatory bodies uh, worldwide. Um, some of it is for NETSA, uh, for the safety uh, authority in, uh, in the US and NASA for the uh, unmanned uh, traffic management uh, for the drone and self-flying uh, robots. These innovation, this, all of this connecting all the dots uh, created this new innovation wave in autonomous vehicle uh, and the biggest large total addressable market main application are the both the transport of people and also the transport of goods. I'll talk more in this talk about the transport of goods component. So what is the path from a go-to-market for AVs, autonomous vehicles, uh, as a factor of complexity and the safety risk involved? Some of them might have overlap. It's not by, uh, you know, it's not fully, uh, uh, you know, sequential in order. Those, there's an overlap uh, in those. Uh, it started within a controlled environment. That controlled environment is a warehouse. And this is uh, Kiva robots, Kiva systems. 
that got acquired by Amazon in 2012. It's powering most of the warehouses at Amazon. Uh, it's a controlled environment. There's no humans, there's no pets. Uh, it could be hard-coded. Some of those can be hard-coded. So it reduced the complexity of the problem space. Other companies like Savyok, where they have uh, robots within an enclosed environment, uh, mostly applied in hotels and some hospitals. If you go to Vegas in some hotels, you find uh, some of those robots uh, for room delivery. The other application in terms of a go-to-market is the are the sidewalk robots. Uh, companies like Starship uh, and KiwiBots, those are already operational. Uh, they are a low speed, uh, given that they are uh, at a low speed, uh, the probability of uh, safety risk uh, gets reduced. If they are stuck, they could be teleoperated uh, with, a, with a call center, like a call center control center that does the, takes over the vehicle and does the maneuvering to unblock uh, the robot. Uh, those are already operational. I'll talk about them uh, later. Uh, other way from a go-to-market to simplify the problem space is let's go to private communities where we can uh, have more, uh, you know, freedom in, in the going to market and also uh, uh, simplify some of the elements in the uh, some of the elements of the complexity. Uh, this is for senior communities in Florida, in the US, company uh, called Voyage in the, uh, uh, in the Bay Area. The, most of the people who work at Voyage, for example, were leading the self-driving series at Coursera or Udacity. So you could see that knowledge that was created is diffused. Entrepreneurs are creating companies out of that and capital is chasing to, uh, uh, to win in that new wave. So you simplify the environment, you go for private communities with less entropy in terms of complexity and chaos and randomness. Second, the also a, a more a simple, uh, more well-behaved environment are interstate uh, highways. Uh, you see Waymo innovating in this space, a company called uh, Too Simple. Then low-speed vehicles uh, in urban, uh, suburban uh, areas. Uh, and then you go to the more city, you go to the urban places with company like uh, Waymo and Phoenix and, uh, and Cruise. Those are operate in areas that are geofenced. There's already high definition mapping that happened several times uh, in the region to map fully the region with LIDAR and to, under, to understand the, look, the vehicle positioning. Uh, and after that, you go for full autonomy uh, uh, as, as a level five in all traffic, all traffic conditions to be similar to a human being in those uh, in those conditions now if we all of that information all of that cycle all of that technology can be applied for transport of people and also can be applied for transport of goods uh, if i look at an example for the transport pick any of, of those vehicles for the transport of goods uh, all of them uh, follow one paradigm which is uh, pick up in one location go to the destination, do a drop-off. There's nothing in between uh, to do a transfer. Once I pick up the package, I don't do a transfer in between. It's the same vehicle, pick up, picks up a package, go all the way, drop the package. This reminds us of the early days of the internet in the 70s and the 80s. What do we mean? In the 70s, pre-internet, there was a, a manual package, package switching. There was a lot of... Uh, uh, on the circuit switching in the phone days. Um, and we're using circuit switching that analogy for the same day delivery right now. This is the big paradigm shift that happened. Uh, you would use occupy the full transport conduit. I have a line from user A, I want to connect with a destination user C. I'll occupy that whole pipe, that whole conduit uh, of information. The packet switching came and said, I could fully utilize, I could better utilize the, the bandwidth by I do packet switch, if I do uh, packets, aggregating packets together, I do packet switching at the nodes, and then do a disaggregation uh, on the destination. This is not a very simple you know, uh, topology. The topology could be much, much more complex. That's a topology of the internet, uh, thousands, uh, probably millions of nodes if you add the wireless, 
uh, it's a much more complex and grew organically. Uh, and this is what allowed it to scale. So how did it scale? What are the components that allowed this to scale? A big innovation was packet switching. Another innovation is a, a standard headers information that allowed an industry uh, to be created around those headers, understanding the headers, what the header means, open communication protocols, algorithm innovations like Dijkstra for shortest path, open DNS, uh, big industry giant and ecosystem that developed around that, hardware development, software development. Uh, we had uh, innovation in the broadband access networks, not only with dial-up and DSL, uh, there's fiber, there's multi-wavelength uh, fi fi uh, wavelength fiber. But a lot of innovation happened both on wireline and also in the wireless. And it's no longer between universities, it's at the homes, at the offices, it's everywhere, it became ubiquitous. So information communication with IoT became ubiquitous uh, everywhere. We could see it everywhere. Um, and there was also a separation from a paradigm, separation between the transport layer and the application layer. There's a decentralization, there's a protocol for admission to the network and uh, exiting the network. Uh, uh, there was, and reconfiguring the network, millions of nodes, billions of nodes, if you count wireless, and a very strong flourish ecosystem. This took 20 to 30 years to get here. But now let's look at this duality or the parallels between the bits and atom networks. The, on the, uh, uh, the module of transport for the bits is the packet. Each packet has a header. For the atoms, each package have a header about destination, source and destination. And we need to see more uh, standard header information. Is this perishable, the weight, the dimension? Some of those packets could be standard. Some of those packages can be standard. Uh, a lot of what we see, can we do an aggregation? Is this an aggregated packet, a package inside it? There's also other packages. Uh, that information, we, we need to innovate in the header information, standardized. And we have a very strong uh, uh, common uh, knowledge that you could use and learn from the bit work. What other similarities are there is the multimodal transport network. Uh, those are different modalities of transport. DSL cable fiber, which is fiber, which is high throughput, Wi-Fi, wireless, 5G. You also have a satellite with a Starlink that uh, uh, SpaceX is deploying. Similarly, on the Atom network, you have different, this is an R here, different uh, uh, capacity uh, of pipes. You have a motorcycle, you have a car, a van, a truck, ships, uh, drones, airplanes, uh, sea cables, and, you know, airline. Uh, so that's a different multimodality of network transport. When you receive an email and when I'm talking to you, you, me and you, we don't care how the network, how the bits travel, but we know there's a quality of service where that bit information is traveling in an efficient way uh, and could be bypass multimodality of transport networks. The way it does that, there's a lot of switches and, and routers uh, and uh, protocol innovation that it goes through. The uh, at the core of the internet and the transport network is the unit of a metric of a bit per second. How much information I can flow in a unit uh, in a second? Uh, there's a very this is a very well studied field with uh, with information theory and Shannon uh, equation uh, uh, on this. So this is well known, well studied. On the equivalent for the atom network is a unit package. We have to define what is that unit package. Uh, per, uh, per second per meter. Uh, so travel a distance in a certain amount of time. Um, this is less understood. It's uh, more complex and doesn't have an elegant uh, theoretical foundation uh, as the uh, bit work. In terms of headers, we have delay tolerant packets like email and file transfer. We have a delay intolerant uh, packets uh, with uh, MPLS, multi-protocol label switching in networking. That's a voice, that's a video packet. It has a priority in the, in the router and the switches. Uh, we have similarly delay tolerant. This is an electronics. These are closed, these are apparel, those can wait. I could do batching on them and I could give favor from a queuing point of view. I could favor the perishable items, hot items, uh, refrigerated items. Uh, those are delay intolerant with a certain quality of service. And based on that information, 
the network can figure out how to uh, uh, manage that throughput. Similarly, on the data center, when we have a high throughput for storage and compute, we have a high, high throughput warehouses. And I'll show some examples from Amazon. Uh, on the edge, we do caching, we do a content, we have a content distribution network. We could do a similar exercise with an edge, with a local fulfillment, with uh, different hubs. Those hubs could be mobile, could be a moving van or a truck, or could be uh, also a static hub for uh, being closer to the edge. So you have the cloud, you have the edge cloud, uh, uh, the, the edge or fog computing. Uh, there's a lot of similarities that we can learn from the internet. On the endpoint hardware, we have the routers. We have an, we will have uh, Atom routers that does the uh, uh, does the switching and the routing. We'll have gateways for small and medium businesses. You'll have the Atom gate for high throughput wall. If you go to uh, uh, Carrefour, if you go to Target, if you go to uh, the big uh, retail uh, grocery chains, uh, in the future, some of those will be a full wall for a high throughput interface and exchange of packages. Uh, we will be seeing that over the next 10 years. On the modem, every home, ultimately over a span of maybe 20 years, not in the next maybe, uh, it will take some time. We'll have a smart mailbox. Uh, this will be the new home appliance. It will be refrigerated, uh, like similar to a small fridge. Uh, there will be an innovation. The atom box, some of that is already being used in some areas in Japan. Similar to the uh, internet, we the, the API created that decoupling between different services. And uh, that interfaces, that decoupling between the services uh, will also, we could learn from that for a robotics API that decouples inside the warehouse and outside the warehouse, that decouples between, I have a modality of type A exchanging with a modality of type B. Uh, I have a different vendors, I have a different distributors that exchange, once we have a clean interface of the robotics API uh, with you know, an internet layer on top that does authentication, we could do a put and we could do a get, and we know what is the type of the package that we do the put and the get, and so on and so forth. Um, so what is the vision of the AtomNet? You can see it now coming together. And the internet is, uh, the AtomNet uh, will bring a seamless access Anyone can engage on that cloud, on that AtomNet cloud. Seamless access could be uh, people, it could be things, uh, a seamless access anywhere. And with ubiquitous transport, anything that can move, you could have an AtomNet agent on top that is the brain of where it, where it needs to go. Bring seamless access and ubiquitous transport by creating an internet-like open network platform that connects, manages, and routes multi-mode autonomous vehicles. This is my demand side, food, groceries, pharmacy, apparel, so on and so forth. Uh, the whole supply chain could be here. It engages, interacts on the atom nets, transacts on the atom net. The atom net will figure out based on the packet and the quality, based on the package and the quality of service, the right modality of transport and how to do the matching and assignment, how to do a rendezvous and a transfer in between different modalities of transport, how to do aggregation, aggregation and disaggregation, uh, and that does the delivery, uh, pick up and delivery to different uh, destinations. Uh, could be uh, to a person, could be to a home with an atom box, could be to a building, high rise building, could be an atom, atom gate, and uh, could be to a, to a warehouse. Uh, you have also companies that are connecting the inter countries uh, 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 shipping. Uh, we have companies like Flexport that is digitizing the uh, port. Uh, and cross-border transport. Those, a lot of those will be manual. Some of those are manual, but over time, those and those, some of those uh, will, will move towards more and more automation. So we have a human in the loop. Most of the transport, the logistics network right now is run by humans, 99.99%. But with time, with that zero to one inflection point that I mentioned, over the next 10 years, you will see more and more automation uh, in this space. What are the benefits and the downside? Benefits, because of the economies of scale and aggregation and better routing, we'll see the cost per delivery goes down. We'll see on average the delivery time will goes down if we do uh, better coordination. The fastest, fastest delivery time is 
no transfer in between. Just pick up from the destination, go all the way to the uh, to the source, and drop the packet. Drop the package. Uh, there's no transfer in between. Uh, so there's a trade-off, but the trade-off comes to a cost. So the user have the end user has now the optionality to choose that trade-off. I want it right now. I'll pay more, or I want it. You know, I don't care about the time as long as it arrives within one day or two days, and I'm willing to wait and I'll, and I'll, I'll pay less. What does this enable? Uh, uh, you will see that the distribution of food uh, can be made easy, that the distribution of clothes of apparel can be done once the, act, the atom net uh, is uh, ubiquitous and uh, there's a further rollout of it. Uh, uh, poverty will decrease because there's less less uh, waste uh, in the food, whatever is, is, you know, you have to throw it, you could put it on the atom net, there are food banks that will manage that, that ecosystem. Uh, with the better utilization by better packing, and uh, uh, if you go to the streets right now, on the roads, you have different vans moving, and some of them might be empty, some of them might be half full, not all of them working at full capacity, uh, but those don't talk to each other. And when they talk to each other with the atom net, there should be an exchange of value between them. Uh, so I could take, move this on, on, on this van's behalf, on this company's behalf, and I'll pay money uh, for that. Um, so you will see a better utilization, but therefore uh, a better CO2, uh, lower, lowering the CO2. A lot of the new uh, autonomous vehicles are actually going electric. So you see a lot of uh, electric vehicles as this new wave will, will hit the streets. Why we're doing this? We're doing this to simplify and improve the people's lives. This is also aligned with Karim's mission. This is what also drew me to, to Karim. Uh, in the business of improving the lives of people, make it simple. You don't have to worry about where this goes and where, who will deliver it when it gets picked up. Uh, the standard and the quality of living will improve, similar to how we're doing with the, with the internet. Uh, it will open access to many people uh, and the internet of things. I could transact on the uh, AtomNet and the internet. Uh, printer is out of, or the fridge is out of something, it does the delivery uh, automatically. New job creation, cleanup, servicing, maintenance. This is the next industrial revolution for the next 20 years. We need new transport vehicles, package exchanges, switches, automated hubs. A Cisco of atoms will be created, a billion dollar company will be created, an ecosystem around it will be created. We'll see a, a more supply chain automation efficiencies, but also disruption of the existing and traditional supply chain. What we will see is less traditional small and medium corner shops. Those will be taken over by the Amazon of the world. And you don't have, like the shop doesn't have to exist. The ease of ordering uh, uh, will be made simpler and we'll see less uh, car and truck drivers. And let me just check the, uh, I got a chat. Okay, um, the, what is the unique between the atom world and the, uh, the bit world, or the internet and the atom net? Uh, the difference is that the speed, bits travel at the speed of light uh, in the medium, uh, uh, speed is in the, uh, you know, two digits kilometer per hour, uh, not faster than that, unless it's, it's, it's airplanes, but like for local delivery, the speed is two digits. A kilometer per hour is very finite and small. Uh, fault is costly in a lot of the TCP IP. There's a lot of uh, packets uh, retry mechanism and retransmission. This does not apply. Uh, package is faultly, is costly if it's lost. Uh, there is also the element of fungibility. If I want to send a packet uh, between uh, Europe uh, or Japan, it's the same packet. I need to send that unique packet, that information. Uh, but if I'm ordering a bottle of milk from the same brand, I don't care where it comes from. Right? I could, I could be if not from this hub or store, I could find it find it closer to me or another location. So there's a fungibility element, especially in the food, in the food uh, business. Uh, uh, chemical safety. There's uh, should be a regulation on the movement of hazardous uh, and regulated goods. There's also a biosafety element, uh, germs. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we need ultraviolet, we need disinfect, disinfection, uh, pest, uh, odors, uh, smell of food. Uh, there's all those elements that are unique uh, to the atom net. Uh, 
temperature preservation uh, and other eccentricities uh, that are unique and special to the atom transport. With this, over the next 10 years, we'll have an atom nut 1.0 to get it there, and then we'll have a 2.0. What is the 2.0 would look like? Similar to what the internet 2.0 gave us. Uh, we could all, we could, you know, this is where I want your imagination to, to, uh, to go wild. If I have an atom nut for every house, I could do proactive population health diagnostics. I collect, I can collect biosamples at scale every day, every week, every two weeks, every month. Uh, with uh, 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 blood samples, I could do liquid biops uh, biopsy. I could do early cancer screening. Uh, I could do vaccine distribution that we are struggling with right now. Right, so uh, I could. This can be use the atom net for the for the distribution, for the pickup and the distribution. Um, we will see uh, the city infrastructure will change. We'll see automated hubs and moving hubs and stations in the cities. The edge, the content distribution network, the CDN will be more uh, uh, available. You will see it more in the cities. Uh, we'll also see for drones, highways in the skies. Uh, uh, those highways in the skies, those are like a, a virtual 3D tunnels. Uh, this is, by the way, I worked on this when I was a grad student at Stanford uh, for the airline industry. Uh, but now we'll see it in, in, the, in the drone industry. Uh, you've seen this figure in companies like uh, Skydio uh, for, uh, for amateur uh, drone, self-flying uh, drones. Other applications are farm-to-table examples, direct, there's a, uh, reducing the middleman, uh, direct from source to destination. You'll see more empowerment for home chefs. Uh, you, you cook something, you could deliver it immediately. You don't have to worry with the coordination cost, efficient food banks and charity, charity physical items. Uh, just uh, I read today that um, by the CEO of Cruise, uh, Cruise did 150,000 uh, uh, food distribution in San Francisco. That's one out of six residents. And with that, reducing the coordination costs and the opera human operation costs opens a lot of new areas. Less home storage and more rent. Uh, I need a, a drill rather than buy it and store it. I could rent it. Uh, machine to machine. I talk, mentioned the uh, fridge or a printer example. There can be marketplaces that can transact. You don't have to go to Amazon. They automatically, there's an IoT marketplace for that transaction. I'm combining an internet and an atom net. I, have, I could also have a token-based machine payable web. Uh, this token is uh, the medium of exchange. I mentioned between two different companies, two different suppliers exchanging packages, but that token of exchange, there's an exchange of value, it could be a token base. Um, you will see an ethical and traceable supply chain. We've already seen it in the diamond industry with a blockchain based uh, tracking companies like Everledger and Tracer. This is skew chain blockchain uh, company for the, sub, for the supply chain uh, economy. And you could see innovation, uh, Helium is a, uh, is a, a Wi-Fi uh, where you could use public Wi-Fi. They'll set up base stations in the cities. Uh, you transact using the Helium uh, token, uh, Helium network token. Uh, you could use the Wi-Fi and pay, you know, a little bit of few cents equivalent uh, any, on any public, you know, on the Helium uh, uh, associated Wi-Fi company, Wi-Fi networks. So it's a new innovation. That innovation might also trigger some of those innovation in the Atomnet, where I could buy or, an in, or a city could buy some, uh, uh, some robots. Uh, they could uh, service them and they could put them on the internet, on the Atomnet for transacting. There's an admission control and they can start transacting and they make money out of that. New things will evolve. That's the beauty of how the, the Web 2.0 created new things that we didn't exist, uh, we didn't think about. So it's a very ex exciting uh, space. Now let's sh show you how this is coming together. Uh, it's happening right now. So let's connect the dots. Now that we drew the big picture and the arc of history of how things were moving, let's continue on that trend and do an extrapolation to the future based on what we know right now. This is the uh, data center, but for atoms, this is an Amazon uh, uh, warehouse. Uh, this Amazon warehouse is fully operated by uh, robots. Those are the Kiva robots. The, what is interesting is that the items that are more popular are, are put on the edge 
for easier pickup and reducing the, the travel between the interface and the uh, inside the warehouse. Uh, so any items that are more popular are on the edge. Items that are less popular, you see them more towards the center uh, because the distance to go fetch them would be longer. So they are less popular, so they could be farther away. Um, innovation and in reinforcement learning in AI algorithms in robotics are hitting uh, showtime. Uh, this is a company called Covariant uh, uh, that does uh, uh, uses vision uh, for an unstructured world that does pick up and sorting. Uh, we've seen also this with a company called Fetch Robotics that does inside the store, it does the scanning, it does the sorting, does the pickup, and then it could go to an atom box or an atom gate for the, inter for the exchange. Uh, a lot of innovation in the in robotics for different uh, industry application. Uh, this is uh, KUKA uh, Robotics uh, towards automating a whole factory. What is interesting in this is that the forklift are also being automated. That once you hit the technology, that zero to one technology to perceive the world, perceive humans, uh, perceive the environment and have a motion planning of how you navigate the environment, you start applying it to all different areas. Anything that moves, once you add that, that agent on top, that, that, uh, that robot could be a smart robot that can navigate and it could be autonomous. So that, uh, this is happening and you just need to extrapolate this further. Let's, if you heard about Cloud Kitchen, this is a cloud supermarket. It's already happening in the UK, okado.com, you could go there. Uh, in the UK, uh, that's a data center. Right, for packages, for storing, uh, sorting, replenishment, uh, packaging, and uh, delivery. So that's a cloud supermarket, similar to the cloud kitchen example, but this is fully automated. If you look at the innovation in uh, routing pickup inside the store, inside the warehouses, uh, those could be done by humans. With the economy of scale, those will be done more and more by, uh, by, by robots. If you look at the sidewalk robots, uh, those are already in the wild, given that uh, the risk factor is very low. Uh, this is a Kiwi robot being trialed by DoorDash. Also, Postmate also uh, experimented with those. And you could have uh, a mobile hub that does the replenishment of those, of those robots. This is driven by, by a human that does the replenishment of those robots. You do a balancing network, rebalancing, and then you do a, repl uh, a replenishment. Um, big companies like Amazon, uh, this is the Amazon Scout, and uh, like FedEx are also uh, experimenting uh, in this space. Um, but it's still at a relatively small scale. This is one of the early companies in this space called Starship. It has a collaboration with uh, Mercedes-Benz for a multimodal exchange between a van for replenishment and a sidewalk robot for the last 100 meters delivery. If you look uh, at this tweet, Starship does uh, a trip around the world in two weeks. Uh, but to give put this into perspective, uh, at Karim, uh, we travel around the world uh, three digits every day. Uh, so as a from a scale point of view, they're still in the early early stages. Uh, it's not a fair comparison because you know we travel long distances and this is meant for short distances deliveries. Okay, uh, the other innovation uh, that you see is the low speed vehicle. We'll talk about Neuro. Uh, there's also Neuro equivalents in, in China with JD.com is innovating in this space, a company called You Deliver, You, de you Deliver. Uh, you see this is a super frame, it's multiple packages together. Could, this could also ease the, the exchange uh, of big of big packages. Uh, on the multimodality package exchange, this is from the Mercedes-Benz concept. You have a full pallet already sorted. Uh, you drive it towards a destination, and there's a small sidewalk robust that does the last hundred meter delivery. There is also innovation of how can I have uh, uh, where the robot cannot travel. I could have a drone for the last maybe ten or twenty meters, short distance delivery, come back, recharge the battery. Uh, this is happening. Uh, the switching atom switch, atom router that I talked about, this is already well established in the industry uh, for uh, sort and queues. Uh, so this is already existing, uh, already mature. Now let's talk about the atom box and atom gate uh, example. 
This is Whole Foods. Once it got acquired by uh, by Amazon, they uh, re uh, they reorganized the Whole Foods uh, 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 real estate on the inside. And I want to double down on this figure. Uh, here is what I mentioned about the atom box, uh, atom gate. Um, do you have atom gates? But inside the store, let's double click on this and see what does this mean. On the outside, this is gonna. These are the racks that you see. All the racks you see. All the food here. These are the racks. So the racks are for the delay tolerant packages. Things that are delay intolerant that need refrigeration are put in a, a rack of uh, fridges. Uh, deliveries, uh, DoorDash, Uber Eats, others. Uh, they come here, they pick up the item, they have a tag, they have a header, they scan it, they're off. A lot of those are, they have to, have to come inside. How this will evolve, all that wall will move to the outside, plus an uh, authentication, a security, physical security, safety uh, mechanism uh, to open the doors of those boxes. And then the pickup will happen on the outside by humans and ultimately will be automated by robots. Those, uh, this is an example of an atom box, uh, atom gate. Uh, you see these in the streets. I've seen those in Dubai. Uh, some of those might be refrigerated in the future. Most of them are not right now. But those can be used static hubs for batching and caching. Let's say I deliver something. I want to pick up a few things. Uh, the atom net will tell me to come drop it in here. Someone else will, is, is going to a certain uh, residential destination. Those are already aggregated that person or that robot will collect them and go to the next, uh, for, uh, go to the delivery uh, with more, in a more efficient route. Uh, so those are happening. And in the caching and the content distribution network on the edge, uh, Amazon is experimenting with dark stores to be a hub, to be like a static hubs that are closer to the demand. We've seen uh, it is a lot. We've seen Noon that are also trying to experiment. Those are very early stages, uh, uh, you know, experimental ideas. But if you extrapolate the arc of history where things are going, we're going towards a future of an atom net uh, where multiple modalities will be connected uh, to simplify uh, the lives of people by connecting the world with seamless access and ubiquitous uh, transport. This is my presentation, and thank you very much for listening. Happy to take your questions. Dr. Sharafuddin, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating talk and very interesting topics. We do have some questions. They're all good ones. Uh, let me begin with the, uh, a couple ones uh, that are quite similar. It's obviously coming from the networking kind of uh, people in the, in the group here. A question I thought of myself. Packet loss, you touched upon that, right? Packet loss, package loss. You can't lose packages as, as often and as flexible as you do it in a real network. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, that's what I mentioned, what's unique to the AtomNet. Uh, packet loss, like fault, is, is costly. We cannot afford to do that. So right? you have so, to have reliable systems uh, to support uh, zero loss. Uh, on a similar pattern, uh, what, what do you consider to be the basic unit in this uh, in this atom net, uh, similar to TCP/IP packets? Uh, what, what would be the basic unit? A, a, a single package? Yeah, the package uh, volume has to be standardized. Um, I think, like, if you look at the a good package for me is uh, uh, all those motorcycles that does uh, food delivery. They have a package. And that could be a unit. You could use this yeah. as a unit. container. Yeah. Uh, okay. or, or it could be more granular. I think the industry needs to come together and define uh, what is uh, the unit package, what is the unit uh, unit volume. Excellent. Similar to how the industry defined it, a byte, right? Eight bits. Eight bits, correct. Standard unit. Uh, <clears throat> communications and, and uh, keeping things connected. Uh, now, what, what happens if something gets disconnected from the network? Uh, no coverage, uh, some kind of a low, low uh, 4G or 5G in the future. Does it, uh, does it stay by itself? Does it drive to a safe spot? Has that been thought of? Um, this is like, this is, uh, there should be an, uh, a fallback mechanism. If, for example, in self-driving right now for delivery, you know, people transport, uh, 
you could the company the car needs to operate without like with a total disc, uh, uh, loss of communication uh, wireless communication it should be able to operate uh, and similarly there should be a fallback mechanism uh, for for transport uh, because it has the HD map all the, the HD map is already hosted locally so it can navigate to where it's a safe space a safe spot uh, for maintenance maintenance for example let's say if there's a mechanical fault yep great and uh, a social question I guess uh, so with this, with this all this automation, uh, and again, losing the corner stores uh, in, the, in the new world, what will happen to unemployment uh, and jobs? Uh, a classic question that comes with uh, almost all these conversations. Yeah, um, that's a big one. That's uh, also a more complex one. Uh, I mentioned that there will be a creation of new economies for servicing, for cleaning, for working in the data center, like in the warehouse, uh, servicing the hubs. Uh, those will happen. Similarly, there, there will be a job destruction. There's a job creation. Uh, there's a discussion in the industry about universal basic income. Uh, it has to be played out. It, you know, cities, governments need to decide. Uh, but yes, there will be a loss, a job loss, but there will be also a job creation. Very uh, true. And the touching upon security. Uh, clearly, mm -hmm. cybersecurity and, uh, and crime yes. is, a, is, a, is a common thing. Uh, will this uh, be a problem as well in this world? Uh, it is, right? It will be uh, like if someone, a bad actor, put you know, uh, an explosive and send it somewhere. Right? That's a, that's a, it, it ruins the system, which you already have it. I mean, someone could also, like they send uh, anthrax right, in the mail. Uh, and the way they solve that is that whatever, whatever you send goes through uh, sorting facilities or facilities that does diagnostics and to see whether it's safe or not. I expect that, you know, the ecosystem to develop around that to ensure that whatever you put in the, in the package, uh, you could also have cameras uh, there. The cost of cameras is, is the, you know, through economies of scale and uh, the uh, smartphone industry, the cost is very small uh sorry the, the price is very is very low uh, so you could there needs to be an innovation on authenticated authenticating who can put something in the atomnet this is why kind of the that that blockchain example is important because you need uh, an uh, an immutable source of who put something on the atomnet who transacted on the atomnet uh, uh, those needs to be defined my expectation is that if this would evolve uh, the first use case would be businesses to consumer, not consumer to consumer. Uh, so it's a B2C rather than a C2C, because the C2C, you open it up to uh, bad actors uh, liability and you don't want that. And then the, in the B2C, you, you can authenticate the business a lot more easier than the individuals, obviously. Those admission rules of what could communicate on the atomnet could be much more governed. True. But, uh, speaking of autonomous vehicles, uh, I guess a couple of questions, I'll, I'll combine them, but uh, why is Tesla not using LiDAR? And also, do you have a prediction of when uh, cars on the road will be uh, fully autonomous uh, and fully self-controlled? Uh, so, for Tesla, they believe with multiple cameras and stereo cameras, I have a right and left camera, uh, I could know the depth perception based on that stereo camera. Uh, but to be able to understand that depth, uh, I need a lot of data because I, because I, can, fuel, uh, I can fool the system by, uh, let's say, cut uh, the picture of a car and then put it closer to the camera. Right? They, they will think, oh, it's very close, it's, you know, it's far away, but you actually just resized it and put it close. Visually, it, optically, it looks the same. Uh, this is why LiDAR is more, you know, is more, uh, the industry outside Tesla is choosing to use LiDAR. Uh, with uh, Tesla, you could be fooled by the visual picture. This yep. is why the Tesla, like uh, on, on autopilot, uh, it crashed. There was a, a truck uh, that is reflectant. 
And so through that reflection, it thought that there's a distance between it and the next car. It was a reflection and it crashed. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, however, you could fix this. They have ultrasound radars. The ultrasound radars for short distances, they could know the depth. They could know that there's something here. I need to press on the brakes. Uh, so using this, there's a way to get around it, uh, to engineer for it. Uh, it's, you know, it's yet to be, you know, to play out. Uh, I think Tesla can pull it off because they have much larger data set than anyone else. Uh, they already have cars operating in the wild right now. Uh, and we'll see, right? So uh, the, the jury is out on that. Your prediction for autonomous cars on the road fully? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, the go-to-market is steps in areas with uh, less uh, entropy. Uh, so you will have them uh, in suburban communities first. You don't have a lot of uh, chaos and, 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 and the randomness there. And then slowly they'll make it to the cities. Uh, Cruz chose to start in San Francisco. So let's start with the most complex use cases. And then this will help us get a lot of the edge cases such that when they go to the uh, suburban uh, uh, areas, uh, they are more well prepared for those edge cases. Uh, I would expect 2021, you would see limited pilots, commercial pilots, then uh, to go at scale that globalization will take some time because you need to do HD mapping for a city. So let's say I go to Riyadh, I want to map Riyadh HD in a month. Right? So mapping this in a month right now is costly. Right? And I have to go to Jeddah, I have to map it for them. So that, uh, what you will see is also an innovation to uh, do HD mapping and frequent HD mapping of a cities at scale. Uh, this industry is not a single player industry. There's a lot of ecosystem that will flourish uh, around, around this industry to support it. Uh, so my view is that this will be gradual. You will see it in 2021. They already got the license. You will see it in 2021. GM started a factory uh, to start uh, uh, building cars, autonomous vehicles at scale uh, with crews. Uh, so we'll see more of this over the next five years. Very well. Like in, uh, our, okay. yeah, in, in our region, I would expect to see pilots in uh, gated communities. But those are pilots, not large scale, yeah. Absolutely. Actually, we're, we're, we're doing pilots here at KAUST and uh, we're, we're running a little bit more uh, more things to come around autonomous uh, shuttles and vehicles at KAUST as well. Uh, which brings me to the end of our session. And actually, I'll, I'll make a plug for tomorrow. Actually, Dr. Sharaf Dean and I are on a panel with a few other members talking a little bit more about what's happening in kingdom policies, experiments in the region as well. So tune into the panel uh, tomorrow. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Sharaf Dean, thank you so much for your time. This was very informative. Uh, I, I learned quite a bit by listening to you today. And uh, we've taken all the questions on the call. Uh, there's one last question. Uh, yes, I think last question is answered and we can leave the meeting right now. Thank you so much and take care, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you, Kaus, for the invitation. Bye-bye.